Reporter Paulina Butska is live in Paradise where a suspect was arrested after police say he killed two homeless women and attacked two other homeless people. Paulina. Joe, police acted swiftly in this case. Tonight, however, concern from homeless advocates like Adam Clausen, who helps people experiencing homelessness. My fear is that people are gonna, they're gonna hear about this and they're gonna be like indifferent, right? Because there's a, a level of apathy because we see it so often. There are so many people on the street that it becomes like anything else. It's just, we don't see them as people. They become inanimate objects that we just look past. We know that guy. Well, he's so handsome, what's his name? So what in the world was Adam doing on the news? Well, there's a background story. There was a serial stabber, they're calling it, not a serial killer. I don't know the difference between the terminology, who was attacking homeless women in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. So Adam was called to speak on the news. He's been on the news a couple of times and I wanted to tell you guys the story since he was there and we're kind of transitioning possibly into doing these types of videos. On Wednesday, September 14th, police responded to a call of a woman who had been stabbed and she was found laying outside of the church. Now, this is me piecing stuff together. This isn't proven yet, but it seemed to me like this woman was permanently temporarily living outside of this church. It was found that she was transient. She was unhoused, homeless. I'm not exactly sure the PC terminology that's being used or that's PC to use. I've heard all those different terms on the news recently. So you guys let me know in the comments if you know, but I'll probably just use those terms interchangeably throughout this video with all due respect to this population because this is just so unfair that they're targeted and they become victims so often. The way that it was being reported makes me believe that she was a good woman and that she was staying outside of this church, kind of her home base while she's unhoused and had a really good relationship and rapport with the staff because she was found by church staff when they found out that she was deceased, they were completely distraught. The call came in around 5.15 in the evening, but as police were doing their investigation, they discovered time of death was actually closer to two o'clock a.m. the night before. And they discovered it was a 57-year-old homeless woman, later determined to be Jody Thompson DeVries. She suffered multiple stab wounds to her upper body and her torso. And this happened on the 14th block of University, which is right by UNLV. UNLV is University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I think I'm new here, but it's the it's the college right there. Because of the area that this took place in, the police were able to take footage from surveillance cameras around the area, from apartment complexes and different cameras throughout that part of the city and UNLV. They actually discovered that the whole entire crime was caught on camera. They wouldn't even show it because they said it was that horrific. Ugh. The suspect was wearing a black fedora, a black puffy jacket, black pants, brown boots, and a black surgical mask. And I wanna add this because I live here it's not uncommon to see people in the summer wearing all different kinds of clothing. You can have somebody wearing a black puffy jacket standing next to somebody who's wearing a string spaghetti tank top and short shorts. It's a town where people are transient. People are coming to visit and leaving and there's a lot of turnover in the town. So people, now that we're going into the fall, could be coming from a colder climate and that's what they brought to wear. But that said, your body tolerates different temperatures differently. Said by somebody who is from the Northeast and lived there majority of my life. I should be ashamed to say this, but now under 80 degrees, I'm putting on a sweater. I'm putting on long pants, potentially. I know it sounds crazy. The whole point of me telling you that is I see people all over in the summer in jackets, long sleeves, and I don't look twice. Also, after 2020, seeing people in face coverings just is second nature. I had this happen prior and there was somebody walking down the street with a surgical mask, people would run the other direction and call 911. But now face coverings just kind of become like background noise. They're just it's just part of life post pandemic. When the cops saw this, they started surveilling people in the area. They started asking residents in the apartment complexes because they saw this man take a route towards the east, but they lost him because an apartment complex surveillance camera will only go so far, only catch so much. And then if they go to the next apartment complex and he's not there, he didn't go that way. You can only catch him so far, if that makes sense. Police started asking residents in the area if they knew anything about the man in the black puppy jacket and the black fedora 
black fedora was hard to say. As this is going on, on September 20th, which is just under a week later, police respond to another call. An elderly homeless woman, unhoused woman, had been stabbed multiple times in the upper body and the torso. She was a white woman who was 74 years old. They were also able to review footage in that area. And although the suspect was wearing different clothing, they did determine that he had a very similar build, very similar body type. When he left the crime scene of the second murder, he left in the exact same direction, started walking down the path that he took when he left the first crime scene. So at this point, they knew they had an unidentified suspect. They knew that he was targeting homeless women and they knew that he was operating with a knife. Again, they started pushing the picture out to multiple people in the area, but not only residents, they also contacted other police departments, including the campus police department to see if possibly they had reports or any knowledge of any kind of similarly related incidences. They could connect back to this one that could help uncover what was going on, figure out who the suspect is. What they also did was they contacted the outreach community. So this way they could talk to the homeless to let them know that this was going on. So people could be more careful, go into shelters, do whatever they had to do. Also, so they could see if there were other attacks that happened that went unreported. Because like I said earlier, this is a very vulnerable community. A lot of crime happens around this community, maybe by people who are within this community. There's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of theft. You guys know, I don't have to go there. We need to respect that community. There are people. Like Adam said, a lot of times they just kind of become background noise when you live in a city that has a large population of homeless people, unhoused people. God, I'm trying really hard to be respectful. You just kind of look past them. They become almost inanimate objects and part of the landscape. And it's really sad. These stories we need to use as a reminder that these are people too. They have feelings. They have beating hearts. They have family that worries about them. They have dreams and aspirations. They've just fallen on really tough times. And so many of us are one bad decision or just one bad life circumstance away from being in their shoes as well, especially right now. Okay, off my soapbox, back to the case. They reached out to the community, to police departments. The forensic lab was working on this and they had uncovered a ton of forens forens I can never say forensic, except the one time that I can cut that out of the video. So they uncovered a ton of forensic evidence. They began installing forensic cameras all throughout the paths that they believed that this suspect was traveling after committing these crimes. The very next day after the second incident, police responded to a report of a stabbing. There was an unhoused woman around her 30s and she was pushing an elderly man in a wheelchair. Both of them appeared to be unhoused. They were traveling westbound on the sidewalk and and from behind them, the attacker came and rushed up behind her and immediately started stabbing her in the neck, upper body, and the torso. Once the woman fell to the ground, he went towards the homeless man. He started stabbing him. He pulled him out of the wheelchair. And at this point, concerned citizens started calling the police. So they were in the area. They were surveilling it anyway, and they were able to get there immediately. They got a very detailed description of the suspect and the way in which he left the scene. Because of the forensic cameras and because of the extra police force in the area, up due to the previous murders. I hope I'm making sense. Why are words so hard for me right now? They were able to get the man immediately on his path towards home, we now know, and get him in custody. Once in custody, once they had him, he pulled out a knife. It was a big knife in a black sheath. This knife matched the description of the knife that they had on camera during the first incident, the 57 year old female outside of the church. The suspect was identified as Christopher Martell because of the incident with the two people and they were able to catch him and they had all that footage of him traveling those paths home during the first and the second murder they were able to quickly execute a search warrant. They determined that he lived alone. They determined that he lived in an apartment complex very close by. When they went into the house to search it after obtaining that search warrant like almost immediately, they discovered the black fedora, the black puffy jacket, black pants, brown boots that were worn on that video during the first murder. And they also found a pair of black and white shoes they believe he wore and they saw on video during that second one. Based on all of that information, the attacks on the two people, the woman in her 30s and the man in the wheelchair, they were able to book him on two counts of attempted murder, two counts of murder. 
Because this just happened, there is no sentencing. We don't know a motive yet. Although I thought this was so interesting. Jodie Thompson DeVries had a twin sister. That breaks my heart. My mom had a twin brother. Unless you have a twin, have a set of twins. I don't think any of us will ever understand the bond that exists between twin siblings. My mom never recovered after her brother passed away. She cried for him every single day of the rest of her life. She died eight years after he died. It was really heartbreaking to watch how lonely she was without her twin brother. Jody's twin said she will not rest until there's a motive figured out. And I understand that based off of watching my mom after losing her brother to cancer, like wasn't a murder or anything. It was also very fascinating to me because one of the videos I watched, the reporter asked a psychiatrist, what would be like the motive and why stabbing? The psychiatrist said with stabbings, there it's a very up close and personal attack of passion. Usually the victim is a surrogate for somebody else in the attacker's life. So this isn't the case, but I'm just going to make this up as an example of a hypothetical situation. Let's say an attacker is targeting blonde women in their 50s. Come to find out that he was abandoned by his mother when she was in her 50s and she had blonde hair. So now he's going after those women because they're taking the place. They're a surrogate for that person that he has those deep rooted emotions and all of that anger towards. He also said male perpetrator, women victim, is always, or at least almost always, related to a very specific motive of the attacker. Back with the example of the mother in her 50s, he obviously has very deep-rooted abandonment issues or whatever it is. So now that's a crime of serious passion. And whether he understands it consciously or not, that's the motive behind it. It is believed that that knife that Christopher Martell pulled out when he was arrested was the knife used in all three crimes. Police are also saying that they're looking into other open cases throughout the area to see if Christopher Martell could be connected to any of those. They also said that he has no prior history, but they are looking extensively into his personal history to see if he is related to any open cases. And number two, to kind of get into his mind to help when future homicide investigations are going on, kind of like to get a peek into his criminal mind as to why he would do this and target this specific population. Bringing it back to what Adam said in in his interview with the news, which I think he did such a great job. I always get so sad when they like cut it down to four seconds out of like a 35 minute interview. But at the same time, I think they did an excellent job cutting it down and portraying that part because he's absolutely right. Like there's such a level of apathy. People become so indifferent. I say that we use this case as a reminder to not look past the homeless people. There's something that you could do, even if you financially you can't help them. And I get it. There are so many homeless people here in Las Vegas like my heart breaks and I want to help every one of them. When I can, I help them that way. And let me stop myself and say this because it always broke my heart. My mother used to say this and I think it's just their generation where they're like, don't give them money, they use it for drugs. Well, let's flip that. What if they did use that money to not be sick, to get themselves checked into rehab? Do you see what I'm saying? And who cares if they use that money to not be sick for a day, two days, to call their mother. God, now that I'm a mom, I just think about these young kids and their mothers worried about where they are. Okay, we're not gonna go down that road because I'm gonna make myself emotional. You could do it just by sharing a smile, just by rolling down your window and just say, how are you doing today? I hope you have a great day. God bless you. So many people just look past them. It's so degrading and dehumanizing for these people who are already so down on their luck. I might not necessarily have money to give, but I have a closet full of clothes that I'm not gonna wear all of them. I ordered a package of socks not that long ago. They weren't the right fit. They actually hurt me while I was running. They showed too much on the ankle. They didn't work for me. Instead of sending them back and costing more money in shipping than the socks were probably even worth, and I decided to give them out to homeless women in the community. Community. It would have cost me more money to send them back. Things like that. I'm gonna end with this story. A couple days after this happened, and thank God Christopher Martell was already in custody, Adam got a call from a woman who had been released from jail. He was trying to help her get a job. We didn't at the time know she was homeless. Like, not that she was released from jail and homeless, which is true. Like, she was a homeless woman for three years prior to going to jail. She's explaining this to him, and it's on speakerphone, and she's like, no, I got it. I know how to live. I have a generator. I have a tent. I usually stay around here. They stole my generator and my tent and I lost everything, everything of everything she doesn't have while I was in custody. As she's speaking and we're trying to help her out and like send her to places and get her a job, hook her up with a cell phone. All I could think about was thank God 
this suspect is in custody because I don't even know this woman. Aside from hearing her voice on the other end of a phone conversation that I'm not even a part of, I wouldn't have been able to sleep that night if I knew this woman who checked every box, white woman, middle-aged, living on the street, down on her luck, was out on the street if this guy was still unidentified. So that's it. If you guys want, when they uncover a motive, when you have sentencing, I'm sure it's gonna be a while because they're not releasing any of the interview. They're not talking, obviously they can't if you guys know anything about criminal justice. Like they're not going to do that before he's sentenced. It could hurt the case. But let me know, I could do a follow-up video on this one. I could do a folly, folly <laughs> a follow-up vi video on the Robert Tellis, Jeff Gearman situation because a lot more has come out about that. But I might wanna wait until he's sentenced, which isn't gonna be for a little while as well. And I have a few other cases that I want to talk about. One that like started this whole thing and all of this stuff just started snowballing. Somebody commented on my last video and they were like, my God, I would have a field day just listening to police. What is it? Police scanners. You know, I think that's what it's called in your city. And I was like, girl, I could do a whole true crime channel just on this city alone. I guess they don't call it Sin City for nothing. We're not going to do that. But these are kind of more like time specific. And I just wanted to boast on my handsome hubby about being on the news. They call him a lot, which to me is amazing. And it's kind of a full circle situation for him, for us, etc. Okay. I'm going to go dye my hair because your girl should never ever play with bleach. I learned this when I was 16 years old, yet I decided I was gonna do my own highlights and I decided that I was a hairdresser and I was gonna do great. And I have a huge, like this thick orange stripe in the front of my hair. So we better go do that while the baby's sleeping. I love you guys so much. If you made it this far into the video dealing with like my Italian hands and all of that, then obviously like we're vibing. So you might as well go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I would appreciate it. Give this video a thumbs up. It really does help me out so much in YouTube and your girl needs help in YouTube. I love you guys so much and we'll see you in the next one. Mwah.